Hey everyone, welcome to Voluntary Virtues Network. I'm your host, Mike Shanklin. Joined also with my co-host panelist, I think in this case it would be better to call him a co-host, Mike Dano. How you doing, Mike? Hey, not bad, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, good to have you. As, as many of you know already, we have an Ask Me Anything from a Stefan Kinsella, a very famous libertarian, anarcho-libertarian is, I think, the label that he likes to associate with, which I, I really enjoy that term as well. Uh, but he's an intellectual property attorney, has is a staunchly anti-IP, for those who don't know, staunchly anti In fact, one of the, uh, the, the best anti IP speeches I've ever seen online was from Kinsella himself. Does a really good job and, and has a lot of support in the voluntarist community. So, always a pleasure to have you on the network, Stefan. Hey, Mike's glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, the plural. So, uh, listen, let's let's just jump right into this. For those of you who haven't seen our past interviews, we've had Kinsella on over the years about four or five times at least. So, I'll throw up the videos you'll you'll see in the recorded version afterward, the archive version, all the different uh, annotation links to go to those other videos. So, you can get his intro, where he came from, et cetera, et cetera. We want to jump right into the tough topics tonight, just like I did with Walter Block and Jeffrey Tucker and David Friedman the last few weeks. So, uh, let's, let's go right into immigration. I think we have a great question from Joe Postov. He wants me to ask you, uh, he first made a statement, he says, once there was a man who came from Hillel, the rabbi, uh, the Hillel and Hillel converted him, saying, "That which is despicable to you, do not do to your fellow." This is the whole Torah, and the rest is commentary. Go and learn it. We need this for those who wish to make the case for liberty, and for those we wish to hear it. Sound bites, unfortunately, are what people hear today. Can you suggest a clear, concise, and short argument on free immigration that is also persuasive? The boiling point on this issue is so low. He says it's hard to get, you know past the very first base because most people kind of have it on the back burner. So I want to hear what you have to say to people when they say, when you hear somebody complain about immigration, maybe if a voter, maybe even somebody who considers himself a libertarian, how do you usually like to approach uh, immigration as a, as a whole? So it's a, uh, it's a topic that always causes emotional, somewhat nationalistic instincts sometimes among people. Um, most arguments against immigration, I think, are either based in economic illiteracy, right? The, uh, the idea that more competition is worse, protectionism, job protectionism, um, or some kind of racist, tribalist nationalism, right? Uh, we don't want um, America to become a Spanish-speaking country, that kind of thing. Or the idea that Americans are superior and everyone else is inferior, and so if we let them come in and they get the right to vote, they're going to vote worse than we do, which I don't see how it's possible. So to me, to my mind, that's not a good argument. There are some good arguments in the second best sort of case um, uh, of concern for immigration. Let me my just view is, there. Yeah, what, a, lot of, a lot of people who say that they're afraid that people were going to come over here and vote Democrat is what I hear a lot of the times, right? They're going to just vote Democrat. Exactly. I, I've, I've found that most people who come from like Puerto Rico or some Cuban region, they usually have more of an anti-state position. Like they, they've escaped tyranny, so they've seen it firsthand. Not all of them, but I've seen that pretty heavily, or some of them who, who have been disassociated. Obviously, there's the Democrat, La, La Raza, et cetera, but that's the, the general t you know consensus I've seen on it. Do you agree with that or not? No, I do. I, I don't think I don't think immigrants are any better or worse as human beings than anyone else. I think they come here, they want to shut the door, you know, to the gates to paradise behind them. Um, uh, but you know, um, I don't think that I don't think immigrants are any more. Uh, look, most immigrants that come here have to have a little bit of fortitude, a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of of, of uh, cojones to come to a new country and try to make it. I think most people that come here – now, I'm talking about the U.S. case. It could be different in some countries, okay? But in the U.S. case, people are not coming here to get on welfare. They're coming here to have a better opportunity in life, um, and I think that's the kind of people that you in general, um, in, in general want. Um, now, Hans Hermann Hoppe and some of these sort of paleo-libertarians in the last couple of decades have pointed out something… What they've tried to do is they, they try to say that so long as we have a state, there are going to be costs of a policy of immigration either A or w one way or the other. In other words, 
if you open the borders, which I think we should do because you cannot as a libertarian or as an anarchist support the federal government doing anything other than committing suicide and di disbanding, uh, you really can't be in support of the federal government rounding up immigrants and things like that. Um, but on the other hand, if the federal government is going to maintain a monopoly of territorial control over the United States and impose affirmative action laws and anti-discrimination laws and have a welfare state, then what you're doing is you are causing what Hoppe calls forced integration, and I think that's actually a real problem. Um, of course, it's caused by the state, not by the immigrants themselves, but um, – you can't just blind yourself to the problems and say that, well, the obvious solution is for the state to uh, open the borders. Well, the obvious solution is, is for the state to get out of the way entirely, right? But if the state opens the borders but maintains its security state and its affirmative action policies and its road network, etc., it's going to – it will cause other problems and violations of people's rights, and I think we need to recognize that, and it's a problem of the state. Yeah, you know, I guess my whole thing is because in a free society, honestly, you and a hundred other people can, who come together and want to start up a a Galt Sculch, I think is a perfect example, right? If they don't want to have uh, a certain person there, I don't know, you know, have maybe if they they hate men, right? So they don't want men there. It's a group of women, and they don't want any men there. Well, it's private property; they have the right to exclude. So I can see that under the hopping argument from a proper a, pri a private property perspective. I just kind of hesitant to say, you know, to attack one of the other sides uh, based upon an, an, a tenant from another characteristic. Of course, the, the real answer, like you already stated, was just to completely abolish the state altogether and allow free uh, inter enterprise and free exchange and, and, and free trade and property rights. Uh, Mike Dano, did you have anything to add to the immigration thing before we move on to another topic? Uh, yeah, the, the immigration the immigration issue, I think, oh, I, think you're, I think you're right, Mike. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Stefan. Uh, a lot of people they, they make the cliche arguments that you hear all the time. Well, you know they don't speak the language. Well, to quote Doug Stanhope, well then don't talk to them. You know the guy who speaks the language perfectly is next door, and you've lived there for eight years, and you haven't said two words to that guy. And well, they 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 take up. American jobs and they're burdening our tax systems and they get into our health care and our education system. Well, what the hell do you think you're doing to me when you're popping out with a bunch of kids? Oh, yeah, well, just let me get a, bunch, a couple new jobs and yeah, yeah, I'll pay for them. I'll wave American flag, pull up a chaise lounge, sure. But the real, the real argument, those arguments are put in place that are real cliched arguments of that they're taking American jobs. Well, if that guy comes across the border and he's all tatted up, he's got no shoes, and he doesn't speak the language, probably doesn't have any education, if he's as qualified for your job as you are, then you are a loser of, some ep of epic proportions. And I would be ashamed to have anyone find out that guy took my job. And I think that's really the whole cliched argument of why people don't want immigrants from Mexico coming over the border. And on the other hand, I think it's an economic issue in this country. If we had a better economy, I think people would admit that they would probably need them and they'd be accepted. But instead, the federal and state governments have made them into like a scapegoat. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of ones that come here and they work hard are pretty much demonized by the whole of the country. And it's not like they, they come here with uh, five cars, a house, you know, on their back, <laughs> right? They, they create demand as well, just more so than a newborn baby. All right, let's 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 move on. So, uh, uh, Dino, you have another question that you want to ask to Kinsella? We can move on. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so Robin Kruger just did a video uh, about young people coming into the freedom movement, anarchism, volunteers, and... They have a little trouble with their parents not liking what they believe in. Uh, what is your message to the newer members, the younger members that have taken on the belief of self-ownership, self-responsibility, and non-aggression? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> most most times, I see the opposite, where I have you know I see libertarians of my generation, or maybe a little older, a little younger. 
and they're wondering uh, how they can convert their kids into libertarians or whether they should or what the appropriate rules about that are, right? Um, so now you're talking about the opposite situation, like if someone becomes libertarian or has a passionate interest in ideas of liberty and their family doesn't. Um, I think that the, probably the best general advice is to just do what Leonard Reed and Albert J. Nock talked about, which is to be a, a good example. In other words, if you have excellence in your life, if people know that you have character and integrity and honesty, they know you're sincere, they know you actually listen when you talk to them, um, over time people will gravitate towards your message or at least towards listening to you. They'll come ask you for advice. They'll say, what do you think about this? So instead of pushing the message on people, I think it's better just to live an exemplary life and by the power of attraction, as I think Leonard Reed called it, um, people will gravitate towards you. Um, other than that, I think it's just you know th there's a reason why there's an expression of uh, don't talk politics and religion to, in front of strangers. Sometimes that goes with close friends and family. You you gravitate towards people because of your common interests with them and things you have in common with them, which is not always politics. Um, I guess I would always stand if someone. My personal approach is if someone asks me a question, I always answer it. I never refuse to answer a question, but I don't always volunteer, right? If they're not asking for my opinion, I mean, I'm not always the most important guy in the room, right? They don't always want to hear what I have to say. You don't always have to weigh in on a, every p p particular topic that is going on at the dinner table and weigh in with your libertarian stuff. If you do that too much, you become a bore. Uh, so I would just say be a, a decent person. And be honest and open, and uh, bring things up naturally. And if people are interested, fine. Lots of people are never interested, and I don't. I haven't myself discovered a way that you can make someone interested in something that they're not naturally interested in. So, I just wouldn't push it. I would just be who you are, um, be honest and open and sincere, be willing to answer questions. But you you can't go around proselytizing. Um, all the time and beating people up, you just sort of come um, an annoyance. Yeah, but I think the you know that's a great point too. I agree. I completely agree with everything you're saying. What, what we're really worried about is we have a person. Let's just take the scenario: we have a person who's 13, 14, 15, wants to get into freedom, uh, into voluntarism, but their parents won't let them do so or are very weary of it. You know, you can imagine what it would sound like saying. Hey, mom, dad, some guys on the internet want me to join this anarchy thing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? It'd be just kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, wow, that would be really freaky for a 14 year old, 15 year old uh, parent, uh, the parent of a 15 or a 14 year old or whatever to hear that. So, but if, at the same time, you would think that the kid, as long as it's free speech and they're not allowing, you know, they're not encouraging violence or some criminal actions outright, you know, hurting other people, you would think that as a parent, there would be some leeway in there. Maybe some time for explanation. If the kid's good enough, he can explain it. But what would you say to the 14, 15 year old who who wants to understand voluntarism, but the parents are you know parental controls? Any word with the word voluntarism is blocked from search engines, etc. How how would you as a child be able to handle that? Uh, you know, uh, just a general question. Or is there no way to do a hide in, in a closet till you're 18? Or <laughs> well, what's the best I, I way mean, to do that? I, I, oh, and now we're – this is fine, but we're straying, I think, totally from libertarian <laughs> theory and principles. It's how to live a life in a certain condition, which is how to be a, a developing child, a developing adult really. If you don't have parents that basically are really great parents, I mean they could be somewhat good parents, but um, in my own experience, I've seen that parents that are at least somewhat decent will respond to a, a repeated – impassioned, sincere, reasoned argument by their child. They will follow their child's lead. So I would say, mom and dad, listen, here's my reason for this. I'm interested in this. I'm not going to hurt anyone. I'm not going to hurt myself. I mean, really, unless you have an abusive parent, what's the question? Can is the, is the parent not permitting the child to read what he wants to read within within bounds? I mean, not pornography maybe or whatever, but you know, read whatever he's interested in. Most parents would do that, right? Uh, what about having friends, or what does it mean to join a community? If you're on, if you're online, you can join whatever community you want, you know, just by voluntary interaction. Um, so I guess I would say, um, yeah, if you have to wait until you're 18, that's one thing. 
But if you're in that kind of situation, it's really not good. <laughs> I mean, if you have the kind of parents where you have to wait until you're 18 to get your liberation, your manumission, so to speak, I doubt they're doing a good job raising the child in the first place. And I don't know if we could even expect that the child will have educational opportunities and be socially well well developed enough that when he's 18 he can go out on his own and accomplish things anyway. So there are tragedies out there, but for most people, most parents, even if they're unaware, I think they're decent people. And I think if the child just honestly talks to them, don't try to persuade the parent. Don't try to convert them. Just say, let me pursue my own interest. This is my current interest. When I was three, I was into dinosaurs. You know, When I was seven, I was into transformers. Uh, now I'm into political theory and justice and ethics, and let me pursue it. I, I don't see why a reasonable parent wouldn't um, agree to that. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, let's move on. Um, thank you for your honest answer. Uh, well, we have a question from a person named Joe. They didn't want to give their last name, so I guess anonymous. Joe wants me to ask you, what are your thoughts on libertarian legal order and the death penalty? Obviously, you have stated before that it would exist, you think, in some regions, <clears throat> but do you think it would actually be a plausible scenario? He says that in most cases he sees it in too much of a threat um, or a liability that you know future liability of putting somebody to death that might be innocent it could be proven later on uh, there's just too many scenarios where the death penalty he thinks would be abolished um, he wants to know do you do you think plausibility wise the death penalty would actually be used in a libertarian legal order society outside of, of immediate self defense um, yeah so so first of all let, let's clarify a few what I think are kind of easy issues that kind of hems in the problem first of all, I think if you have to kill someone in self-defense, it's totally justified. Uh, I'm definitely not a pacifist in that kind of uh, sense. I do believe there is a right to – I'm not saying that pacifism is not um, a good strategy or a personally, ethically justifiable course, but I do believe there is a right to use lethal force to defend yourself. Um, and it doesn't have to be exactly proportionate. I mean I'm not saying you can shoot someone for a minor crime, but… You don't have to, you know, if you're being threatened with a serious enough crime, I think you can go all the way and defend yourself. To me, that's the bottom line of any kind of justice based society. Um, I also think that as long as we have a state, we should never be in favor of the state having the death penalty or even prison, to be honest, um, for several reasons. Number one, the state can't be trusted, it's incompetent, it's corrupt, it's evil, it's the biggest enemy out there, and so to focus on Private criminals, who, who many of which are very bad, but to focus on them instead of the big enemy in the room, which is the public criminal of the state, um, is to have misplaced priorities. right? And also, the state has many things that it calls crimes, which are not real crimes. If the state was only executing actually guilty murderers, you know, maybe you would say the state shouldn't be doing it, but it wouldn't be that big of a human tragedy. Um, and th there's the other issue is that the state is, um, is, is, is not just a state, but we're all uh, infallible. We're not infallible. We're fallible. There's a possibility of mistake. So, and the problem with the death penalty or capital punishment or, or really any punishment is the possibility of mistake. So I'm totally opposed to any existing state administering any kind of capital punishment, including any punishment, to be honest. Um, um, now, in a free society, what can we expect? I do believe that on occasion – well, first of all, I think crime would be much more rare in a free society because we'd be richer, more civilized, etc. Crime would be a rare thing. When it happens, you would defend yourself, and when you failed, then the question is what do you do with the, the lawbreaker, the outlaw? Well, one thing is you, you identify them, and you… Outlaw them and you exclude them from society unless they can somehow integrate themselves back into society by making some kind of restitution, some kind of apology, some kind of contrition. Um, I do find it hard to believe that there would be in a free society institutionalized punishment at all, which means incarceration or execution, etc. Because the costs are so high and because it really accomplishes so little… I could see incapacitating people or even killing people that are standing threats. I could see some people becoming outlaws if they refuse to try to reincorporate themselves into society. 
Um, but I do believe that um, just the cost involved in retribution are so high and the benefits are so low that it's hard to imagine a free, private, justice-seeking, low-crime society actually having a corporation whose job it is to capture people and to kill them. I, I just don't see it happening on a widespread basis. I could imagine on occasion that the, 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 the relatives of the victim of a violent crime um, are so outraged and so dissatisfied with any restitution-based award would just go take vigilante justice into their own hands. And in those rare cases, I think it would be ad hoc. It would, would not be institutionalized. It would be ad hoc. Probably most people would just turn their eyes and let it go. They wouldn't be convicted. You might keep your eye on this guy because he's a little bit dangerous now because he's taken law into his own hands. So it would be a marginal, ad hoc, occasional, random issue. But I don't see capital punishment being used in, on a widespread basis um, in any civilized society or torture or even imprisonment. That, that's sort of my normative, predictive uh, perspective on this, and I've written on this before. Yeah, good stuff. And, and just because you've written on it doesn't mean the viewers know. That's why I drill you on this stuff. So yeah. there's a lot of things I know that you've done, and you've done great work. So uh, that's one. No, I'm just saying I've got a blog post. I've oh, yeah, you're pointing towards it. Yeah. Just search my name and, like, Randy Barnett, restitution, you'll find you'll find the post where I kind of go into this stuff. Perfect, perfect. Uh, one, we got to kind of move quickly. We've got a lot of questions here. Um, let me see here. Stephanie Krinswens, I hope I said that right, wants me to ask you, do you believe labor unions would exist in a free society? Obviously, you can make a voluntary union of workers, uh, but would they really have any power? Would they even form in the first place knowing they wouldn't have that real power like they do with the state unions today? That's a good question. Um, look, uh, I, I've had a, a knee-jerk anti-union reaction being sort of conservative in my upbringing and in my libertarian understanding of how modern labor unions have gotten extra market power because of state laws. Some of my left libertarian friends have um, opened my eyes a little bit to this, and they've uh, made, me, made me understand that um, normal unions uh, have been corrupted by the state. In other words, the unions we have now are not really what you would expect to see. Um, now, as a, as, a, as a libertarian and as an Austrian economist, I don't really see a tension between labor and capital. I'm not a Marxist. I'm not a Marxian. I really don't see a tension. I think there's a natural harmony of interest. And in fact, I think every, every person in the free market is a bit of a capitalist, is a bit of a laborer, is a bit of an investor, is a yep. bit of an entrepreneur. It's a spectrum that's spread across all people. Um, I mean Michael Milken at the height of his uh, career was making half a billion dollars a year of salary as an employee, but he was obviously the one in charge, right? I might have no boss and no employer and have my own shop selling something I'm making, um, legal services, art prints, Starbucks, coffee, you know, coffee, whatever. My employers are basically all the people that pay me to produce, all my customers, all my uh, my clients. Are they my bosses? In a sense, and in a sense, I'm their boss because it's a mutual relationship. So I'm very wary and leery of over-reliance upon the way the state classifies relationships between people. The state will say, you are the employer, you are the employee. And then they say, well, if you're an employee as opposed to an independent contractor, there are certain requirements. You can't accept a minimum. You can't accept a wage less than a minimum wage, et cetera, et cetera. So the state classifies people and categorizes people according to its arbitrary classifications, and then it regulates them. It has to classify in order to regulate um, because it's frustrating to the state and to re – regular people who want to control things, that there are no objective classifications and categorizations of people. We are all a mixture of entrepreneur, actor, investor, employee, employer, 
there's really no economic difference between an employee and someone who has a job as an independent consultant. Economically, there's really no difference. We might group them this way for economic purposes to try to understand things like uh, the, the nature of the firm, etc. But then the state comes in and imposes these categories and sets them into law and uses them to regulate and control and tax uh, people. Um, so I don't see a natural conflict of interest between the l labor and the employer in a free market. I think they actually are harmonious and they support each other. It's a symbiotic relationship. So I suppose I could see some kind of free market union um, project emerging in a free market, but I find it hard to believe it would be a very big thing because, number one, we would all be so wealthy in a free market, and everyone is basically an owner of capital in some sense and an investor that there's just not an inherent classist conflict of interest. This is part of the Marxian idea that separates society by classes. We view people as being part of this class or that class. If you really want to do class analysis, you should look at what Hoppe has written, Hans Hermann Hoppe, and he says basically Marx had it right except Marx was wrong in his economics and separated people by whether they were exploiters on the basis of owning capital or being the laborers. What Hoppe said is, well… Real exploitation is committing aggression, and that's the libertarian insight. That's the libertarian touchstone. So if you want to separate people by class, it's the state versus us, and the state is the institutionalized use of aggression against innocent private people. So if we're going to really get into this kind of analysis, we have to keep in mind that the state is the problem. The state is the agency of institutionalized aggression, and… Um, uh, if we're going to have a union, I think we should have a union of <laughs> the oppressed opposing what the state does to us, the you know the uh, the servile class. It's called voluntarism, <laughs> anarcho-libertarianism, right? Yes. No, yeah. yeah, voluntary union. I guess there, there, there you go. You do, you are a supporter of uh, the voluntary virtues workers union. It's a joke. It's a joke. All right. So uh, let's move on. Michael Dana wants to ask the next question. Go for it, buddy. Yeah, sure. So. When you when someone gets arrested for whatever crime and they get charged and they get put into prison, they pretty much lose all their rights. They they, they only allowed minimal amount of rights, three course meals and a shower. Uh, when they serve their time for whatever charge you, they they had, let's just assume it's a gun related crime. When they get out of prison, they're no longer allowed to get a gun. In your opinion, should they be considered that they served their time and have that right to own a gun returned back to them? What's your opinion? I think as a general matter, I would say yes, um, although I'm a little bit leery of buying into the state's logic of you you've you've you uh, you've engaged in what we call a crime. You violated some social rule that we say you can't violate, and there are known penalties for violating it. And the way to um, get out of this is to pay the time, pay the you know pay the price, which is a fixed time of of, um, of incarceration, basically. Um, I mean I could see in a free society that if there was to be some kind of punishment or retribution or incarceration, maybe it's not uh, a fixed time. Maybe it's based upon some other criteria. Um, maybe some people are, have proved themselves to be such standing threats to society that they should be locked away forever um, or cast out of society. But in today's society… As a general rule, anything we can do to limit the state's discretion and the extent and severity of the state's ability to punish people is a good thing. Anything we can do to reduce the state's power to incarcerate and harm people is a good thing. It is tr probably true that a large number of people in jail are really genuine criminals and dangerous people. Of course, they've been made dangerous people because of the prison system itself and also because of the result of state laws like welfare and 
uh, unemployment caused by inflation and by the business cycle, which is caused by the Fed. I mean, there's any number of things you could point to where you could point to the root cause of criminality um, as, as the state's fault. Okay, so I don't deny there are bad people in jail, but there are a lot of people in jail that are only bad because the government calls them bad, right? Because they sold cocaine or marijuana. Um, so if I could open every prison door right now, I would push the button. If I could free every every criminal, even if it meant freeing some really bad guys, I would do it because the state is the real enemy, and there's lots of innocent people in jail, people that have not violated anyone's rights um, um, what, whatsoever. So, so I suppose um, I suppose that that's that's sort of my answer. I, my main hostility is aimed at the biggest enemy in the room, which is the state, and in our world, it's the United States government. I mean. It's not Russia or Cuba or Iran. It is the United States of America, our federal government. It's not Louisiana or Texas. It is the federal government of Louisiana. That's the real enemy. It's the most dangerous enemy we've ever faced in humanity. It's powerful. It's entrenched. And uh, it's not the only problem out there, but I think we have to keep our eye on the ball, and that is the big enemy that humanity faces right now. All right, well, let's talk about this for a second. What, what do you think of when people say, you know, obviously China is still more communistic than the U.S. is, right? It's more fascistic, you would think, or even more communist, has more centralized authority over the means of production. So uh, they even outlaw Facebook in some regions, for goodness sakes, you know? So people would look at America and say, well, you have the, the freedom to go and, and go to your soccer games. And for the most part, you know, like, you, you don't have to worry about having... Uh, a windowless van come up to your house and just kidnap you like you do in, in, in some other regions. So why why is it I, I agree with you, the federal government is growing completely out of control and it's it's a it's a wreck and to me of course all tyranny is bad, but yes, the federal system is really, 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 really bad. But I want you to, to pinpoint some reasons why you would say that because there's some people I can already hear it, you know, the devil's advocates out there saying, Well, look, why why don't you just go to move to some other region? I, America's not that bad. Can you pinpoint why right. yeah, go ahead. No, I, I totally uh, – first of all, I do not agree that we live in a police state in the United States, um, and I don't think it's getting worse in every respect. I think it's getting worse in some respects, and it's getting better in some respects. I mean the overall tax burden and the level of spending of the federal government has not really changed radically as a percentage of the overall economy I don't know, 30, 40 years. Um, what the U.S. government does, it does under the cover of law. This is the problem. This is why it's insidious. I don't think we're, the U.S. is the worst government just because there's something special about the United States. I think we're the worst because we're the richest. Hans Hermann Hoppe has an article where he points out that there's a sort of perverse uh, relationship between uh, countries ruled by states that have um, internally liberal policies, by which he means a free market. And they become more imperialistic or warlike externally. In other words, if you have a better internal uh, domestic policy, you tend to have a worse foreign policy. And the reason for that is simple. It's because the government that happens to be parasitically um, funding itself off of the productive economy that it happens to be clinging onto uh, is going to have more resources at its disposal. So the United States happens to be the largest free market economy not only in the world but in the history of the world. So the government that is the tick that sucks the blood off of this beast, which is the United States federal government, is going to be engorged in massive – I mean go to Washington, D.C. You'll see the riches. It's incredible. It's incredible. But it's getting that because it's parasitically sucking energy and resources from the free market economy. Then it uses that to fund Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and the military industrial complex and to um, have a $400, $500 billion a year military, which it can use to bully um, other nations. And it will use it because the resources are there. The government really doesn't pay for them. They're there. 
they're there for the politicians and the planner's own aggrandizement. Um, it's natural to assume they're going to do it. I mean, what's Russia going to do? What's Iran going to do? Iran is small. Russia is medium-sized and poor. China is large but poor on a per capita basis. So, of course, we're going to have the largest military in the world. And it's just naive to think that the government in control of that is not going to use it. So we have a paradox. The paradox is that the richer we are, the better our internal policies are, um, the more dangerous is any government that is in control, which is the reason why minarchists are completely out of their minds if they think we can never have a limited state or a limited government. You cannot. In, in a sense, the better the government's policies are, the more dangerous that government is. Which is why the only stable and peaceful solution is to have no state whatsoever. If we had a free market here with no state, we would be a hundred times as rich and have no institu institutionalized war or peace. We wouldn't be provoking the Arabs and the Muslims and the, the rest of the world. We would just be a beacon, a haven of freedom for the world. Um, we'd have open borders. We'd have dynamic trade, we have innovation out the wazoo. Um, we, see the, we see glimmers of that now. We have that now to some degree. But if we can unleash this free spirit of the, of the country… So basically the state is always the real enemy. Um, anyway, I rambled, but that's my, <laughs> that's my and, take on that. Sorry. And I completely agree with you. Uh, yeah, it, it is a nice vision. <laughs> I have it in my head all the time. That's the that's the end goal. Um, you know, obviously I'll never be able to experience that, uh, at least not in my lifetime. But hopefully I can help bring it sooner for people a thousand years down the road, or et cetera, whenever it happens. Uh, maybe even just a small region breaks away, and I can help with that. Anyway, uh, some more viewer questions here. Big James wants me to ask you. Big James over on YouTube wants me to ask you. I have a question about IP. I'm a musician, and I always wondered about fair if fair use. Would apply for using a short sample, like a line or two, from a movie or a TV show in a song. How do you define fair use? Because there seems to be some disagreement on that. So, um, fair use is an exception to the copyright regime. Um, I think the entire copyright regime is a, an infringement of freedom of speech in the first place. <laughs> it's a horrible idea. Um, so, if there's exceptions to it, that's a good thing. Although one reason the government permits these exceptions is to smooth over the rough edges of the horrible, otherwise horrible consequences of the policies that they have. So in a way, it lets them get away with perpetuating the system just to have these exceptions. Uh, but as a general matter, I'm in favor of the exceptions. The exceptions are written very vaguely, number one, because they're written by – in statute. They're not like common law evolved. They're not a response to a, a dispute over real resources. They're not a justice-type uh, response. Copyright law is an artificial system designed to promote a certain policy, which is to encourage artists to have more creative expression. And the fair use exception is another policy. It's to permit commentary excuse me, and nonprofit use of these works that otherwise you wouldn't be able to use because there's copyright in the first place. The way that the, 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 the legislators in Congress came up with fair use, and it's called fair – there's other terms in other countries. In the in U.S. it's called fair use. Um, there's a list of factors, so you're supposed to just apply these factors. There's, I think, four main factors like the extent of the use the amount of the market is going to hurt, whether it's a transformative use, etc. The problem is that it's legislative, and it's not, it's not objective, and the answer always comes down to what some court or jury ends up saying when there's a dispute that goes to court that's expensive enough to justify going to court in the first place. And on top of this, the Congress in 1998 enacted the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which a lot, which what, which does the following. It it basically gives undue power to copyright holders to have things taken down from the internet um, if they just allege that there's a copyright infringement. Okay, so if a takedown notice gets sent to YouTube saying 
this video that you just posted of your son at his birthday party because someone in the background is playing a Beyonce video or maybe they're singing happy birthday. If someone just makes an allegation, I claim there's a copyright infringement. You have to take this video down. YouTube slash Google has to take it down because if they don't, they lose the safe harbor protection, which is a protection that the DMCA says as long as you respond to these notices, you're not liable for what other people do. So this makes these content providers and these ISPs, the channel providers, makes them risk averse. They will instantly just take things down, and there is no fair use judgment call there because no robot can do this. No minimum wage worker can do this, and there's no assertion by the um, – um, there's no requirement that the, the complainant prove that there's a copyright infringement, and there's no penalty if they get something taken down that shouldn't have been taken down in the first place. Okay, So in practice, what happens is because of the statutory nature of the copyright regime… Uh, and because fair use is ambiguous and vague, fair use means almost nothing. right? So, so let's say I want to do a documentary, and I'm walking down the street, and I'm filming people. I'm filming scenes for my documentary, and there's some things in the background. Someone could make an argument that, oh, there's something in there that's subject to trademark or copyright or whatever. Now, yeah, are you saying like you record a Nike sign in the background? Something like that, or okay. even someone's face, which is a, which is which is another IP type right, the right of publicity. Um, now, let's say that, let's say you could hire a law professor to write a, a seventeen thousand word argument arguing why everything you're doing is fair use. Okay, I guess you could do that, but it's not definitive. It's not clear. It's not the call of a judge. You know, it's not the definitive pronouncement of a judge. And so anyone financing you is going to be leery of liability. They're not going to finance it. They're not going to let you sell it. Um, they're not going to let you show the movie in their theater. They're not going to let you distribute the movie. And so this, this encourages – it either adds a lot of expense or it causes self-censorship. People censor themselves because they want to get the movie out there, so they, they have very anodyne messages which are stripped of anything that's possibly offending or copyright infringing. Right, so fair use does almost no good. It's a little bit more liberal in the U.S. than in other countries, but that's just on the on the areas that have been settled already. Anything that's cloudy or vague or beyond it um, basically gets censored. So one solution would be to get rid of copyright or to reduce the term. But of course, we could make cop we could expand the fair use um, defense, and of course we should. We should make it more clear. We should expand it. But of course, Hollywood and the music industry fights that tooth and nail every time we want to even clarify fair use because they hate fair use. Right, right. Yeah, it makes perfect sense too. I mean, uh, they have an economic incentive to make sure that they uh, are pro-statism in that situation. All right, so let's uh, let's move on. I got a, a question of my own. I, I kind of we'll get back to the future questions here in a second, but I want to hear what your thoughts on the whole climate change. Uh, Discussion that's going on. You know, do you believe that the, the Earth is getting warmer? Uh, you know, what statistical evidence do you have? Um, go for it. <laughs> well, I don't pretend to be an expert on on that issue. Um, I, my opinion is that um, I'm skeptical of um, of the idea of even climate change, um, uh, and I'm also skeptical that it's a bad idea if it is happening, and I'm skeptical that we're causing it if it's happening. I, my my understanding is that we've had climate change for hundreds of millions of years. It's a natural part of the process. Um, if and to the extent human activity is causing it, then the only solution I can think of that is reasonable and consistent with liberty and property rights is basically to internalize externalities, which means to have better control of property rights, which means if you're if you're polluting and you're causing damage to other people's property and someone can show that, that should be a cause of action. But if, if that were the debate, then we could have a real debate about it, but that's not the real debate. The real debate is about 
um, human uh, overuse of energy and consumptionism and the West taking unfair advantage of the East or the South, however you want to call it. So um, I, I'm again, I'm more concerned about the state than about climate change. Um, the, the solution to climate change is supposed to be the state, but the state is the biggest killer and destroyer in modern life. The state is the biggest polluter, the biggest destroyer, the biggest murderer, the biggest killer, the biggest liar. Um, and so I would rather have free market economists or free market companies come up with a way to build three-foot walls around the entire coastline of most, most uh, continents – then rely upon the state to solve a problem that the state is largely responsible for in the first place if it's even a problem. Hey, fair enough. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, the, the guy in a, a referee game who uh, – well, I guess it's different. It's like somebody hitting somebody else and then saying they got hit by them, but really they're the ones who hit first. It's kind of like they're the ones who pollute all the time, and then they say that Three people are polluting, which we're not even free. Anyway, so let's move on to the next viewer question. This one is from a YouTube handle, Kinshi Kinji, and they want me to ask you this. A question for Kinsella is, my question is getting rid of government uh, through the shortest route possible. They believe that this is encouraging a financial, financial collapse through peaceful means. That means by voting for all the bad laws, and hopefully people will see that government's bad and people will go on a completely different course. What, what do you think about some people who say, well, we need the government to collapse uh, for us to be able to bring about freedom quicker? Well, again, this is just my take, and I could be wrong. Um, first of all, I'm leery of the word government. I, I try to use the word state. One reason I do that is because um, pro – non-anarchist types will try to trap you with this argument. If you say – they'll try to say, well, don't you think we need law and order? Yes. Well, that's the government, so how can you be anti-government and whatever? So they always try to trap you with this equivocation. So if government means the institutions of law and order, then I'm in favor of government, but I'm against the state. The state is the monopolized control of territorial use of force in a given jurisdiction. That's what the, the state is. Now, what the state does is the state monopolizes certain institutional features of society like money and banking and roads and defense and even government you could say and and over and law and over time people start equating these things with the state so we libertarians see that the the state has taken over the government and the state controls the government so when we say we're anti state we sometimes say we're anti government and that makes sense but the average person equates government with law and order. So if you say you're anti-government, they think you're anti-order. They, they think you're for chaos. This is the eternal dilemma. So that's one thing I would be clear about. So I'm against the, the state. Now, the question is, so how do we um, – how could we ever get to a, an anti – to a non-state society? I mean – I heard so, someone say uh, before uh, about this argument that your caller has used. Um, they're arguing worse is better. Well, it seems to me pretty common sense that worse is worse, right? Um, I suppose it's possible to imagine going through a, a, a painful period in which the phoenix could rise from the ashes and we would have a libertarian society emerge at the other end, and the price would have been worth paying. I think that's their argument. The problem is, first of all, you can't argue you, – you can't say that unambiguously. You can't say that the death and destruction caused in the interim is worth the price, or is, is worth paying because it's, if it's a violation of rights, it's a violation of rights. And second of all, they, I think they have no reason to believe this. I think if we had some kind of civil war or some kind of societal breakdown, there's just no reason to expect a libertarian paradise to emerge. It would probably just be worse. Um, so I'm afraid that the only and, – and so – and he also talks about voting, so voting for A, B, and C. Now he's talking about voting for the bad instead of the good for some strategic purpose, but the underground, underlying assumption is that voting is a, is, a, is a moral and an efficacious way to get things done politically, and I don't believe it's either one. I think voting is usually useless 
on an individual basis and is always immoral um, to, just to participate in the system. Um, or almost always immoral. I don't blame people for voting against a, a tax, you know, a, a bond increase in their local county or something. But basically, if you're voting for a Republican instead of a Democrat or vice versa, you're participating in a small evil way in the system. Um, I believe. Okay, so I don't think voting would be the way to do it anyway. And anyway, it's not going to happen. Um, the only way to achieve a free society, I think, is to have a majority libertarian population. So the question is, how do we get that? Can you engineer it? Is it possible? Can we hope for it? Do we just have to wait? Do we have to give up? You know. So these are the questions that are the fundamental questions. And my view is that the only real solution is that we can hope that um, over time the level of technology and the level of free market interaction and the level of intercourse between people of different countries increases so that people, French people know English people, etc. Um, and that um, um, teaching events happen that gradually a consciousness emerges and we just become smarter as a people. Right? We, we realize that centralized planning doesn't work. We realize that freedom is good and free markets work. And I think that's happening slowly. If you think about the the, uh, the the average commentary a typical person would have about the viability of, say, communism, Russian-style communism in 1982 compared to 2012, there's a big difference because in 1991 or 1990, whenever it was, um, communism collapsed. And everyone – they don't understand it like an Austrian economist might. But there's a widespread understanding that we have to have free markets and we have to have some liberalism, they call it. So these are big teaching moments in history, um, and I think that's what we can hope for. We can be there in the background as pushers, as, as libertarians, as evangelists, as advocates, trying to help do what we can to enlighten one or two or three or ten people that we know personally or that we can touch on the internet. Um, and we can help preserve a body of knowledge that's, that's there. It's like Albert J. Knox's idea of the remnant, right? We're the remnant of civilization, except I think in his time when he wrote, it was a lot more bleak and desperate than it is now. There were maybe a dozen or two people then. Now there are hundreds, tens of hundreds of thousands of us. Um, hey, you, know, you know that movie Idiocracy? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think it's funny and all that, but I think it's really – wrong from a historical perspective because if anything, cognitive abilities are going up. Whether you take IQ tests and quotient set that seriously or not, the, the point is people do have a better cognitive understanding today than years ago. People are, can't understand more. They might not be pushed as hard through the public school system, right? Uh, but that's a different story. I think the abilities... Humans evolve. This is my point, is that evolution happens in, in everything, I think, and this is just another part of evolution throughout hopefully, I think, throughout human history is as we gain more knowledge, we understand that individualism, it's just the logical and rational perspectives start to make more sense and are more tangible to us. And when you can see them as real-life examples around you, a gold sculpt that will be successful, more people will think, hey, that's something I want to emulate, right? So I think em yeah, uh, evolution we, is we have, um, e even if human intelligence is not increasing, which I don't know if it is, in fact, I think there's an argument that human intelligence may be going down because of the welfare state and the perverse policies the government set in place, but just the existence of computers and cell phones and Wikipedia and Google and interconnectedness in a way is improving our intelligence as a species, right, and as right. individuals even. So yeah, I, I think it's – I'm kind of an optimist to be honest. I think that I, – I view the, the free market as like a, a big Mustang, okay? And the, the state is like a bunch of Lilliputian little demons with little ties and tethers holding it back. And the question is, can the Mustang get enough speed to keep going and to outrun or at least live with all these little parasite suckerfish on it? And I see the future of humanity possibly – I don't want to be uh, Pollyanna – but possibly as the Mustang springing free and finally running free of these little parasitical creatures or becoming so big and muscular and powerful that they just don't matter. 
that no one cares about them. They're just little warts, basically. They're not, um, they're not strong enough to, to bring it down and to kill it because really that's what the battle's about. The state really wants to survive, but it's doing it by trying to kill human society and human civilization. So it's really a battle between death and life. The state is death. And, and the free market and individuals are freedom and life. Um, that, that's our battle. Hey, we, we got to stop it right there. Like, hey, Stefan, go ahead and give out plugs for your website, etc., and we can move on. Just go to uh, c4sif.org. You can find uh, everything you need to know about me there, c4sif.org. And as everybody knows, we do have Stefan Kinsella every fourth Monday, 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on the Voluntary Virtues Network, which is taking off, exploding out the gate. <clears throat> I want to thank everybody who's had a hand in making this successful. Hundreds and hundreds of radio show hosts now added on to the VVN Network. We're trying to have a 24-7 network going forward for all of humanity. <laughs> so hopefully this is a new project that will, a new venture that will push the message of freedom and anarcho-libertarianism into the future. Getting that horse off, you know, maybe it's an antibiotic for that horse on those parasites. Anyway, Stefan, we'll have you back soon, and uh, thank you so much once again. Thanks. Enjoyed it. Yes, sir. Make sure you guys check us out every every Monday, 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The very first Monday, we have Walter Block. The second Monday, 3 to 4 p.m., we have Jeffrey Tucker, uh, David Friedman, the third Monday, and Stefan Kinsella, the fourth Monday. So great lineup here on the Voluntary Virtues Network. We're going to see you then, uh, hopefully next time. on uh, This next week, I will not have a show. From the four, three to four session, I'll be getting back from Porkfest. So just deal with me. I, we'll be launching the new Vivia network. I'll be doing a lot with White Cloud Security and my other jobs. So lots of hard work coming for me. Just stick with me. And here in June, we're launching the full network, a full launch. Really excited about that. We'll be advertising, et cetera, et cetera. So stick around on VVN, and we'll make sure you guys have some great stuff, great content to share with your friends, family members, people who you want to get in the discussion of an anarcho-libertarian society. Michael Dano, thank you for being a, a panelist and a wonderful co-host with all your great questions. Hey, for you, Mike, the world. <laughs> awesome, guys. I'll see you at Porkfest in a few days, all right? <laughs> all right, guys, and hope to see many of you at Porkfest as well. I will be there tomorrow around sometime this time tomorrow afternoon. So I, until then, thanks again from Vivian. <laughs>